Hi everyone, this is Ken Stoltzfus again. This is our last video lecture. Uh, this evening we're going to be talking about uh, psycho psychological assessment in middle and late adulthood. So I want to start off talking about uh, psychological assessment in middle adulthood. Just a little bit of background on uh, Erickson's ideas about middle adulthood. Uh, your textbook says that middle adulthood covers from about 30 years old to about 65 years old. Um, Erickson saw this a little bit differently. He started his adulthood stage, which roughly corresponds to what we're calling middle adulthood. He started that stage in the mid-20s. But as we talked about last week when we talked about emerging adulthood and young adults, with the changes that have happened in a lot of Western cultures, at least, where people are waiting until their late 20s, early 30s to really establish careers, to finish their education, to buy a house, to get married, to have children, that sort of thing, um, a lot of people feel like maybe middle adulthood really doesn't start until about 30, year old, 30 years old now, which uh, back in the day when Erickson was uh, developing his theory, it would have started earlier. Um, because of this, there's also uh, a note in your book that, that the young adult uh, developmental crisis, which is intimacy versus isolation, um, figuring out how to be close to someone, how to be in an intimate relationship, that in some ways this may continue on into the earlier part of this middle adulthood year years or this stage because because people are uh, waiting until later in life often to get into serious relationships to get married sometimes they haven't resolved that intimacy versus isolation stage by the time that they're in their 30s by the time they're in middle adulthood for most of middle adulthood though uh, erickson would say that the psychosocial developmental stage would be generativity versus stagnation and so erickson said you know this middle adulthood is a time when we focus on being Generative, which means we're being productive, we're being creative, we're trying to improve the world, we're trying to give back. Um, this is a time when there's a lot of focus on work and parenthood. Um, and so those are ways that we can be generative, ways that we can be productive and creative by, by investing in our work and our parenting, that sort of thing. But what he says is if we don't master that, if we don't, if we don't do those things we need to do to become generative, then we get kind of stuck and we just stay in place, we don't grow. And another word for that would be stagnation, just meaning that we kind of stay in place. Um, if you're not familiar with this word stagnation, sometimes um, sometimes we talk about this as, uh, we might even say in English that like water is stagnant. You know, if, you, if you've ever seen a pond in the middle of summer where there's no water flowing, um, sometimes that water would be stagnant and just kind of, there's nothing, no movement happening in it. It's dirty, it's, it's, it's still. And so that's, uh, that's sort of what that word means. Some common issues that come up for people in middle adulthood that might lead them in some way or another to need uh, psychological services, to need an assessment. Um, one thing is what we call in America, at least, the sandwich generation. And I'll be curious when I, when I see you all in person to hear if this is an issue in, um, in Lithuania and in the other parts of the world that you're from. My sense from living in Lithuania and living in Russia for a while is that this is an issue, but I don't know how the statistics compare to the U.S. But in in the U.S., when we talk about the sandwich generation, what we're talking about is people in middle adulthood who are raising their children and they're also caring for their aging parents. And so we say that they're sort of sandwiched between their children and the older generation. And you can imagine this causes a lot of stress, where if you're both parenting young children and you're having to take care of your parents who may have dementia or some sort of chronic physical illness, that can be a lot of work. And that can lead to a lot of stress and some psychological uh, symptoms as well. Another thing that's a little different that we also see people dealing with in this age group is what we call in America the empty nest syndrome. And this is where you've raised your children for 16, 17, 18 years of their lives, and all of a sudden they leave and they go to university. And so this person or these persons that you've oriented your whole life around, your, your children, all of a sudden they're gone. And many people feel this sense of psychological emptiness. They feel some depression. And around just all of a sudden, like, what do I fill my time with? What do I do with my life? The opposite of that, of that, which can also cause stress for people in this age group, would be when adult children return home. And in the U.S., this is increasingly common because of the whole emerging adulthood situation, where a lot of times uh, uh, young people finish university, they can't find a good job right away, and end up back living with mom and dad. So mom and dad have made this adjustment. They've gotten used to the empty nest. All of a sudden, the adult children come home again, and that can that can cause psychological issues and social issues and that sort of thing. Um, be curious to know again how much that's an issue in Lithuania and in the parts of the world that you're all from. But I suspect it, it may sometimes be an issue. 
Uh, some other things that sort of become issues, the psychological and physical effects of aging. Certainly people in their 30s um, are, are usually, you know, unless something is abnormal, they're usually very, uh, you know, still very young and they, their bodies and their minds uh, show the signs of being very young. You know, they're, they're psychologically and phys physically healthy. People on the later end of the spectrum, as they move into the late 50s and the 60s, they can often start to see the physical effects of aging. Sometimes they even start to deal with some of the psychological effects of aging. Um, you know, and that can even, that can, those can even be brought on by physical changes that, uh, you know, I realize I'm not as strong as I used to be. I realize I've got less time left to live. And that, that can be difficult for people. There are also increasing numbers of people who either choose not to have children. Um, since the 1970s, when birth control became widely available, 1960s even, there have been some people who just choose not to have children. There are other people that just can't have children. And so for a variety of reasons, some people are reaching this mid middle stage, this middle adulthood stage, and they don't have children. And so um, that can also be problematic for people. That can lead to feelings of emptiness and sadness. Um, even if that was a choice, sometimes people regret that choice later in life. Some other issues that, that sometimes would relate to people seeing a psychologist, one would be menopause for women. This is the change that occurs for women often late 40s into their 50s, um, where their hormonal, hormonal changes often um, characterized by mood swings, some physical symptoms as well. This can be a, a time when some women experience a very unstable time of life, and sometimes that leads to a referral to a psychologist. For men, sometimes we talk about a midlife crisis, and I don't know how familiar you are with this term, um, but if you're not familiar with it, this would be uh, the, the kind of the classic picture of, of a man who's having a midlife crisis would be the man who's in his late 40s, early 50s, and he goes about and buys a really nice sports car, and maybe he has a fling, he has an, an affair with a younger woman, and there's a lot of, there's been a lot of thought that maybe, you know, maybe men, something about aging and men, that they really go through this period of missing their youth, realizing that their physical strength is leaving them, that they're not as strong or as fast as they used to be, and that they kind of overcompensate by trying to act young, by buying a fancy car, a fast car, by finding a younger woman. The research on this has been really sort of mixed and controversial. There, there's not been a research finding that says that there definitely is a midlife crisis. That, but, but we do know from research that some aspects of that ha do happen for some men, that some men really do struggle with aging. And we also are increasingly finding out that some of those struggles aren't, aren't just for men, but that sometimes women struggle with um, this period of life as well. In terms of cognitive development at this time, um, for the first time, you know, in all of our stages up to this point, we've seen people either progressing or staying the, the same in terms of their development. Now we get to the point where in middle adulthood, especially in the later stages of middle adulthood, some things like memory, reaction time, cognitive functioning may start to decline. But the good news here is that they only seem to decline if people don't utilize them. So if people get to their 40s and 50s and 60s and they just sit on the couch and watch TV all the time, they're going to start to see a decline in their cognitive functioning. But if they're reading, if they're active, if they're involved in life, if they've got hobbies, usually you don't see a decline. And you can actually even see cognitive performance improve during this stage. And some of the reasons for that, scientists think, are related to uh, linking experiences that you've had in the past with new information. And that this can actually lead people to, be incre to have increased creativity and increased problem-solving skills. So a lot of people feel like this is just the prime of their life, the 30s, 40s, 50s. This is a time when they've got enough experience to really understand what's going on in the world, but they're young enough and their cognitive functioning is good enough that they're still, um, they're still able to use that experience and put it into, put it into action. That would affect what they're doing now. In terms of some common psychometric tests that we use at this stage of life, um, there's not a lot that's new here. Things that would be appropriate for young adults are also appropriate, appropriate here. I'll just briefly mention a few of the tests that the, that the book mentions. Um, the Beck Depression Inventory, the BDI, which we talked about before. The Hamilton Rating Scale for Depression. The Maudsley Obsessive Compulsive Inventory, the Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Scale. Um, the Beck Anxiety Inventory. The Beck Inventory for Suicidal Ideation. These are all what, what I kind of think of as single issue measures, right? You know, they're measuring depression or OCD or anxiety. Um, 
There's another bigger scale that your uh, that your book talks about that kind of gives um, gives a broader overview of what's going on with people uh, related to personality. And this would be looking at neuroticism, extroversion, openness. And this is the neuroticism, extroversion, openness, personality inventory revised, or the NEOIR. Um, so those are some common tests you may hear about. Your book talks about them in more detail, um, but I just wanted to mention those briefly. Another thing that we've mentioned, I think, in passing in other chapters, but we haven't talked a lot about, so I wanted to take a little bit of time and talk about it now. Um, you all know from going back to the very first lecture that when psychologists do assessment, the interview itself and, and that sitting down with the client, asking questions, finding out about the client is really, really important. One of the ways we do that would be using what's called the mental status exam. Um, and this is just, a, you know, it, it's sort of a, a framework that scientists can use, or I'm sorry, that, that clinical psychologists can use when they're assessing their clients. So I want to just mention some of the things that, um, that we assess when we're doing a mental status exam. One would be the client's appearance. And as the book says, you really want to make sure that you're giving some details here. You don't just want to say the client was disheveled, but you want to maybe explain what that means. And so, for example, one time I saw a client who was in her 60s who was a longtime uh, alcoholic, substance abusing client, and she had lost enough control of her bodily functions that she had actually soiled herself. She had gone to the bathroom in her clothing, and it was apparent because of wetness and odor that that had happened. So this is the sort of thing that I'd want to record when I'm doing her mental status exam. I'd want to record that under, under appearance. We also want to talk about behavior. Um, a lot of times you, you'll hear this term um, orientation, and we don't mean sexual orientation here. That's what everybody sort of thinks of nowadays. But we're talking about whether they are oriented to person, place, and time. Do they know who they are? Do they know where they are? And do they know roughly what time it is? And they don't need to know that down to the minute or maybe even the hour, but we certainly want them to know the day. So if they know those three things, then we say they're oriented times three. That's why I put the X3 there. So if you ever read a psychological report and it says the patient was oriented times three, just means they were oriented to person, place, and time. We also include sensorium in the mental status exam. And this would be, you know, we want to make sure that the five senses are working appropriately. If there's something that isn't happening with one of their five senses, we'd want to record that. We record a comment or, or some comments about their psychomotor activity. And your book makes a good point that, you know, Psychomotor agitation, kind of the sped up psychomotor activity, that can be symptom symptomatic of a psychological issue such as mania, such as manic symptoms. Um, psychomotor retardation would be like a slowing down. That can be symptomatic of depression or other psychological disorders. So we want to we want to record that. Um, their state of consciousness, we want to uh, just sort of record. Are they conscious of what's going on around them? Are they aware? We're going to want to ask questions about the use of alcohol and other drugs. Um, if, the, if the client asks, answers that they are using drugs, we often have much more detailed questions we ask that get into things like the age at which they first used drugs, um, how much of each substance they're using, how much time they're spending, they're spending obtaining the substance, using the substance, recovering from the substance. We want to get a fuller picture of that if that seems to be an issue. We also want to assess their affect, and this would be sort of the physical manifestation of their mood. So do they look happy, sad, etc.? And we want to see if their affect, if their, if their physical presentation of their emotion, is that congruent? Is it consistent with the content? So if they're telling us a really sad story and they're laughing, we'd say their affect is incongruent with the content of what they're telling us. We also want to see if the affect is congruent with the next category, the mood. So if the person says, oh, I'm really sad, but they're smiling and laughing a lot, we'd want to say their affect isn't congruent with their mood. Um, we're going to uh, do some, some assessment of their personality and just sort of what we see about that. We're going to try to understand their thought content. Are they having any problematic thought content, any hallucinations? Um, and that would, of course, be seeing um, or experiencing in some sensory way. Uh, things that aren't really happening. Obsessive thoughts, delusions, um, phobias, fears, that sort of thing. We want to know about those. We also usually ask if there's been a history of physical or sexual abuse. And any more with what we know about trauma, you know, these are important questions to ask because people who are dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, obviously there are other ways that that comes, but certainly physical and sexual abuse can cause that. 
We want to try to understand their intellectual resources. We may or may not do intelligence testing, but we can often tell pretty quickly how, uh, in rough terms at least, how intelligent somebody is or, or their, their level of cognitive functioning. We want to find out about their insight and record something about that. And, and their insight by that would just mean their understanding about their situation, their need for psychological assistance, that sort of thing. We want to also make a note about their judgment. You know, are they making wise decisions? Are they uh, are they acting? Uh, are they are they um, showing good judgment in the ways that they're behaving? We want to find out about their family and life history. And then also, we always want to ask about suicidal ideation and hopelessness. And these are important to ask about, even if the client doesn't say anything about that. In the U.S., we're very worried that if we don't talk to clients about this, and a client would go out and hurt themselves, um, that we could actually be sued, that this, we could be held responsible for this. And so we usually ask about that. Sometimes, if, if we have reason to, we also ask about whether they have any thoughts about hurting someone else. Um, one place I work just did that as a matter of course, just to be careful. Other places would maybe only do it if, if there's some reason to believe the client might have um, thoughts about harming somebody somebody else. Um, we do continue to use projective tests, but as we've said in other chapters, these are controversial. Um, your book has a little bit of a conversation about the Rorschach ink block test. Um, and you know this is controversial. A lot of people have said it doesn't really tell us very much. Um, they mentioned in there that, that John Exner, a psychologist, developed a systematic scoring system for the Rorschach test. And that, that system has been sort of controversial because it's won awards, but it's also been criticized by people. And so um, it might be a more systematic way to use a Rorschach, but we're still not sure that the Rorschach really tells us what, what um, some people think that it does. Your book also has a comment about human figure drawings, or HFDs. And they make the note that, that people still use them, but the use has declined in recent years. One common test you might have heard of, I think I mentioned it in an earlier uh, discussion, is the house tree person drawing test, um, which has people draw just like it sounds, a house, a tree, a person, and then a person of the opposite gender. Um, so that, that would be an example of a test that uses human figure drawings. And then the psychologist interprets those. A few other tests that might be used. Um, the Quality Marriage Index, or the QMI. This just looks at a number of different factors that have been found by research to be related to marital happiness and satisfaction, and rates people by the presence or absence of those factors. There's also the Pressure Management Indicator, or the PMI, and this looks at the work environment and a person's job satisfaction, and gets into things like, like how happy and satisfied are they with their workplace, does their work seem to be causing any sort of mental illness or mental health symptoms for them, psychological symptoms, that sort of thing? Your book includes these tests in this stage, although they could be used in any stage, because this seems to be the developmental stage where marriage and work are really sort of the key, the key issues that people are dealing with. Okay, we'll move on now to talking about old age or late adulthood. Um, in terms of psychosocial development, Erickson says that this is the stage, um, 65 and older, where we look at ego integrity versus despair. And so Erickson says what we're doing in this stage is we're, we're going through and we're looking at, um, we're looking back in our life and saying, have, have I had integrity in how I've lived my life? And by integrity means, have I lived my life in a way that's consistent with what I think is important, that's consistent with my values? And if I have, I develop wisdom from that. I understand that... Um, I've been who I was supposed to be, I, I've been who I feel I, I should have been, and I develop a sense of wisdom that I have something to offer people even at this later stage of life. But if I haven't lived with integrity, if, if I haven't reached the stage where I have wisdom, then I might feel despair because I'm at the end of my life, I don't have a lot of time to change things, um, a lot of my relationships are set now, you know, if there's been any sort of family conflict or estrangement that might be hard to repair, and so I might have despair about these parts of my life that haven't gone well if I haven't, if I haven't, if I don't decide that I've lived with integrity. Sort of interesting. Um, some people break this age group into different aging categories, and I think, especially as people are now living longer in much of Europe and in the U.S., people uh, live on average into their late 70s. It's not rare to see people living into their late 80s or even beyond. And so um, some people have broken this age group into three categories, the young old, 65 to 74 years of age, the middle old, which would be 75 to 84, 
and the oldest to old, which would be over 80, 85 and over. And then there's also this idea of functional age, and this is where we look at a person's activity of, of activities of daily living, and these are related to personal care. And then their instrumental activities of daily living, or IADLs, and these are related to independent living activities such as housework, cooking, shopping. So activities of daily living are taking care of myself, bathing, hygiene, that sort of thing. Um, the instrumental activities are more related to the things that need to happen to keep my household running smoothly. Um, and, and in terms of functional age, we can start to see that there might be somebody who's 65, but if they can't care for themselves, they can't get out of the house to shop, they might actually have a functional age that's older than somebody that's 80, but is still handling those things. So the idea of functional age is maybe sometimes people who are older but more able actually might have a lower functional age. I wanted to just mention a couple of physical and cognitive changes that might affect people in this um, in this age group, and um, uh, that might that might lead or be related to a referral to a psychologist for assessment. One thing that we see in this age group is we do see central nervous system functioning function, functioning decline, and so we see decreased coordination. We see slower reaction time. There's a reason that there are not professional athletes who are in their 60s and older. Sometimes we do see people who can continue on with athletics into their 40s, you know, early to mid 40s. In a few endurance sports, even the late 40s sometimes. But as people get later in life, we just see that they're not as strong, they're not as fast, they're not as coordinated, they don't react as quickly. And that that can, um, you know, that can cause distress for people. If those changes happen too quickly, we might also be concerned that there's some other reason besides aging for those. Um, obviously, the longer people live, the more there's an increased risk of age-related dementia. One of the things we're seeing now, you know, when people used to die in their 40s and 50s, which was not that long ago, I think, I think um, even in the early 1900s, late 1800s, the average lifespan was in the 50s. Now that people are living to the 70s and 80s, we see a lot more people who develop age-related dementia. When people died earlier, they died before they got age-related dementia. So sometimes we think, well, why do we hear so much more about people having Alzheimer's disease and that sort of thing than maybe we would see in the histories of 100 years ago? It's just because people are living longer and these are diseases that tend to come out or tend to emerge later in life. Um, we also see, whether the person has dementia or not, we do see declines in memory and cognitive processing. Again, if the person is not cognitively active, if people stay active, if they're reading, if they're, you know, they've got hobbies, they're, they're living a stimulating life, um, we can see people fight off those declines in memory and cognitive processing very until very late in life. I had a professor in my doctoral program who was in his 70s then, and he's actually still teaching. So he's in his 80s, I believe, at one of the top schools in the country in my field in social work. Um, he just spoke recently to the United Nations. A great example of somebody that stayed cognitively active and stayed sharp. Just wanted to mention a couple of theories of aging. Um, one theory is disengagement. And this is sort of an older theory. And um, what, what this theory is all about is it says that as people get older, they disengage and they sort of slow down. They separate from active life. And that's kind of a normal, healthy thing. We should let people do that. There's been a sort of a move over time to what we call productive aging. And, and, and by that, um, we mean that, that people are more active, they're more engaged. Um, in the U.S., there's this thing around that where people say 70 is a new 50. And so you see 70-year-olds that are very active in life, maybe the way that they would have been when they were 50. Um, and so there's kind of this, this emphasis on activity or productive aging. A third field is what we call continuity, and this is a little bit of a combination of both. And what it's saying is that the way that you've lived earlier in life is going to sort of continue into later life. So if you're an engaged person, you're likely to continue to be engaged as you get as you go on in life, as you get older. If you haven't been engaged, you're likely to sort of um, you're likely to not develop that as you age. So you're likely to be more more. It's more common that you'd be disengaged later in life. Some of the issues that might bring people in to see a psychologist for assessment, um, physical and cognitive decline. We see people who um, um, just struggle to deal with um, losing strength, losing their physical ability, 
or people who are aware that they're not as sharp as they used to be and they're, they're concerned about that. We see higher rates of depression and suicide among older adults. Um, one of the things that's really troubling, at least in the U.S., and again, I'm, I'm not an expert on Lithuania and your parts of the world, but my, my sense from having visited some elder care homes and that sort of thing is that this wouldn't be uncommon for people to be depressed in, in Lithuania as well, older people. One of the things that really concerns us in the U.S. about suicide is we see suicide rates increasing with age, and we also see that older adults are more likely to complete suicide. So with younger people, uh, sometimes there's a sense that suicide might be a cry for help. And while it's always dangerous, people might be less likely to actually kill themselves. But we see older adults actually being more successful, which is kind of a weird word. We don't want them to complete. But, but they have higher rates of not just attempting suicide, but of the suicide ultimately killing them. Um, we also see uh, we also see um, issues around kinship care. I suspect this is an issue in other parts of the world too, but here in the U.S. we've been concerned because we see high and, higher and higher rates of grandparents raising young children. And so whether that's because mom and dad have either been irresponsible or they've died or maybe more commonly they're on drugs or in jail, they're not capable of parent, playing that parent role. And so often we see grandparents raising children. And this can sort of happen informally where the grandparents just take, step in and take over. In the US, it often happens in the, through the foster care system where if the children are removed from mom and dad's care because of abuse or neglect, in the US, we have laws that say, first we have to try to place those children with the family. And a lot of times the grandparents are the one who step in and take the children. We also see older adults dealing with grief and loss. You know, it's really hard when your siblings and your friends and your spouse all start to pass away. And of course, the older we get, the more likely we are to experience that. And so I'll just mention this briefly. I'm sure that you've had this in other classes, but this is a, an age where we are a stage of life where we often um, see people going through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of, of grief or stages of loss. And you know, that, those are um, the denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. Um, and we, we, you know, we just see people sort of going through those stages as the people around them start to become sick and even begin to pass away. In the US and in a lot of other parts of the world, there are higher rates of poverty with, um, with older adults because they're not working anymore. Um, sometimes um, their, their retirement pension isn't enough to cover all of their needs. And so we see many people in this age group living in poverty. We also see elder abuse and neglect with this age group where sometimes people, and often, unfortunately, oftentimes this, is, these, this would be perpetrated by family members who either don't take care of an older adult that they're charged with caring for, or they may actively abuse them. They may steal their money, um, things like that. We also see this sometimes in the elder care homes where um, uh, sometimes older adults are just left to lay on a bed and they get what we call bed sores or the medical name would be decubitus ulcers. And in the really bad situations, if you let somebody just lay on their back for long enough, we actually see these sores that develop that will actually um, cause the skin on their back or on their buttocks to actually, um, to eventually um, be gone because of these sores developing. And so there have been cases of these decubitus ulcers or these bed sores where we can actually see people's bones by the time they're dis they're discovered. Um, and so in a good elder care home or what we see in the US, a nursing home, there are going to be people who are watching for these kinds of things. They're going to be, you know, even if the person is immobile, we're going to move, be moving them to different positions throughout the day. We're going to be checking to make sure sores don't develop. When those things do develop, we usually would say that that institution's been negligent. They haven't provided the care they need to, they need to provide. In terms of assessment of this age group, one thing that we haven't talked about before that's especially relevant to this age group is assessing depression, or I'm sorry, assessing dementia. And you all probably know that Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. Lewy body disorder is the second most common form of dementia. That doesn't get talked about as much. Uh, the Lewy body disorder, um, this is actually one that it, it looks very similar to, to um, Alzheimer's. The difference is people tend to not have quite the same stability of symptoms. So somebody with Lewy body disorder will actually, um, will actually uh, sometimes be lucid, sometimes make sense, and then, uh, 
and then they'll very quickly lose that. So just for example, years ago, there was a man in my church with Lewy body disorder, and he was in a Sunday school class that I was teaching. And most of the times he just kind of sat there and didn't say much. We weren't sure how much he understood what was going on. One day we were talking, somebody in the class had lost a loved one and was going through a really hard time. And this man, Nelson, with Lewy body disorder, happened to have a moment of clarity. He had a moment where the dementia symptoms weren't present. And he said, I understand about loss. I, I, I you know, that, that makes sense to me. I've been through a lot of that. And we all really turned and looked because we weren't used to Nelson saying anything like this. And very quickly, that moment of lucidity was gone. But that would be sort of characteristic of Lewy body disorder, where um, you see uh, you see kind of the symptoms fading in and out sometimes. But people have moments where they seem like themselves, and that'll be gone again. Some of the ways that we assess dementia, uh, the, the mini mental state exam can be helpful. This is sort of a shorter version. Uh, it's an interview, a, a brief interview that's used to assess somebody's psychological state including depress or, uh, dementia symptoms. There's also a scale, the clinical dementia rating scale that we use sometimes, the CDR. Um, sometimes we do repeated intelligence or cognitive functioning testing. And so, you know, the idea here is that if we've been giving somebody the Wechsler test over time, we can kind of see if their functioning starts to decline. Your book makes a really good point here that sometimes psychologists will use older versions of tests because they want to be able to compare uh, on the same test, somebody scores over time. And so even though the American Psychological Association says we should always use the most up-to-date version of a test um, for, for um, ethical reasons, this might be one time that we use an older version of a test just because we want to be able to compare th that test uh, um, to an earlier uh, uh, test that we gave the person. Sometimes we also use a battery of tests, and there's a list of, of some of the common tests used for this. Um, in your textbook, and these would include neuro neuropsychological intelligence and memory tests. Some other tests that we use, um, maybe more commonly with older adults, the death, death depression scale. Um, I mentioned earlier that as people start coming to the end of their life, they often feel sad about that. This, this sense of our own mortality, we often don't deal well with that. And so this would be a scale to see if somebody is dealing with depressive symptoms because they realize they're aging, they realize they're getting closer to death. Often because a, a, a portion of people in this, uh, in this age group are dealing with some sort of a physical illness, um, another scale that we might use would be the illness cognition scale. And this is just to help understand how people are adjusting to chronic illness. There's also the caregiver distress scale, which doesn't really, um, isn't really used with older adults, but it'd be used for people who are providing care for them. Finally, I just wanted to mention your book talked about George Valen's work, his study of adult development, and they mentioned three scales that he used just to try to better understand um, um, how aging works for people or what it looks like for people. This would be the scale for objective mental health, scale for objective social supports, and scale for subjective life satisfaction. So looking at the effect of aging across those different domains. Okay, that is the end of our eighth lecture. So uh, if you remember from the introduction and the syllabus, um, I will be with you in Klaipeda um, in late March. I believe I'm arriving uh, Monday. Uh, well, I'll be there that weekend, but we'll have class on Monday the 21st. If you haven't checked your email recently, I did email out um, on March the 4th. I emailed out uh, the schedule for when we're having class and where class will take place please, please make sure you can get to those classes because it's going to be very important. The final part of this class, rather than being lecture, is going to be um, sort of experiential learning, learning by doing. And so that this is going to consist of you as part of a group developing a measure of a psychological characteristic. And you can decide as a group what you want to measure. Um, and you're going to be in small groups of four to five people approximately. And so we're going to take that week when I'm in Klaipeda primarily to help you understand how to do that project. So it's going to be everything from forming your groups, finding an issue that you want to develop a measurement instrument for, and I'm also going to show you how to do some of the psychometric analysis with SPSS. And so that's going to be the bulk of what we focus on that week. Please make sure that you're going to be available to come to class at those, at those times, because I am going to be going back to the U.S. at the end of that week, and I, it's going to be very hard for me to catch you up on things that you miss. As always, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to email me. I hope you're all doing well, and I will see you soon.
Bye now.